welcome to my youtube channel if you're new here i am j cool i post interesting videos such as daily news entertainment filming so you need to subscribe welcome to costa now president hagai in the hitchlema finally last year signed or assented to the access to information bill transforming it from a bill into an act this pivotal moment occurred during the president's year-end press conference held in lusaka now the president underscored that the ati significance emphasizing that it represents a fulfillment of his administration's commitment towards legal reforms and pledged this over the years during their campaigns highlighting the promptness of his government's actions the president pointed out that the zambian people had patiently awaited this development for over 20 years and the law was enacted within two years and four months since the upnd came into power the president expressed optimism about the impact of the ati asserting that corruption cases would now undergo swift resolution with a commitment to concluding them within five months due to recent approval of complementary legislation the key question is will the ati stand the test of time and will it be put to a true test my guest this evening is a permanent secretary for the ministry of information and media P.S. Tavo Kawana. Happy holidays and happy new year. Welcome to Costa. Happy new year to you, Costa, and uh, happy new year to our viewers. Great. I think let's get straight into it. Uh, before we get to discuss issues surrounding the Access to Information uh, Act now, it was a bill before, Zambia has been hit with a pandemic, of course, not the whole country, adversely affected is Lusaka, the capital, with cholera. Um, yourself, as permanent secretary in the Ministry of Information and Media, alongside the Minister of Health on Saturday, uh, did hold a joint briefing and uh, obviously toured uh, what has been designated as the epicenter or the, 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 the emergency center at the stadium right here in Lusaka. What would you say is government's effective response towards the cholera outbreak we're seeing on average about 20 to 26 people dying in the last three days well firstly what is important to state is uh, that basically at the stadium what we have there as a center is a fully fledged hospital now so um, people and patients are being screened in various uh, centers and clinics around the city and they've eventually been taken to the, the one-stop cholera uh, treatment center, which is at the stadium, which has been transformed into a fully-fledged hospital. Yes, people are dying, and it is unfortunate. But the majority of the people that are dying are dying in their homes. And this is because people are, are having this community belief that cholera can be cured by drinking cachaso. So when they get cholera, instead of rushing to the nearest health center, they administer cachaso on the patient. And when the patient gets worse, sometimes as they are bringing them to the center, they die along the way and they end up being a BID or brought in dead body. And most of them also are arriving at the point of uh, the, the veins have collapsed. They are just, it's at the end. So you are bringing this patient and within 30, 40 minutes, the patient dies. So it is a passionate appeal to our people that when you see any symptoms, diarrhea symptoms or vomiting, uh, it is important to quickly rush to the nearest health center. Those that are being treated in the health centers are actually being uh, resuscitated, cured, and discharged. But those that are coming too late, well, as it is, it's too late. And most of them, again, are dying in their homes, like I stated earlier. During such a pandemic, obviously, government initiates what you call a multi-sectoral or multi-ministerial you know, approach. Uh, you at the center of communication. From your assessment, what are the worst affected areas? And then when we speak to most of you know, residents, especially in Lusaka, they talk about not having enough information from the government are you satisfied are you doing enough as a ministry in charge of communication to make people aware spread the message and educate them on the things they're supposed to do we are on the media we are also in the communities we have engaged uh, various community drama groups to go around to sensitize the people we are going around with uh, public address systems and megaphones uh, sensitizing the communities and also 
calling on ensuring that we even um, adhere to the presidential directive to bury all shallow wells. And because that is the only source of water for the people, and this is where the problem is, these shallow wells are half the time near to the pitla trees and so on. And because the pitla trees are literally full, and when it rains, the sickle matter rises, and therefore it sort of mixes with the table water uh, and the water table on, on, of the wells, and the people are drawing that water, and that's where they're picking up the coral from. So what we have decided is to, in order to follow the presidential directive, to bury all the uh, shallow wells. And we have placed 10,000 litre capacity tanks in various points around the communities, the hot spots. So we're looking at 300 of these tanks. And we have water bowsers going there every day, two or three times, to go and refill, so that people can have access to clean drinking water and do away with the uh, shallow wells. Then the pitla trees will also have tanks that are going around to empty the, 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 the pitla trees so that we have the fecal matter going as low down as possible so that even if it rains, you know, it will only raise up to a certain point but not necessarily coming all the way to start mixing with uh, water tables. So there's a lot that we're doing with the community. Mm. There's a lot that we're doing in the media. There's a lot that we're doing on the ground. And so we are communicating, but we will continue to do so. What is important is, like I said earlier, to sensitize the people the importance of rushing to the nearest health facility and not this Kachasu story that when you drink Kachasu, it will cure you. Mm. But these measures, or rather the intervention measures, are they enough? You know, permanent secretary, uh, others have taken the presidential directive as uh, unattainable uh, due to the fact, like you've said yourself, uh, people depend on these shallow wells for their source of drinking water, washing and, and daily livelihood. Um, I was just monitoring the news earlier, you know, the, today, this evening, the Minister of Water and Sanitation saying they have put up 98 of these tanks that you talk about. Are these enough? Um, Lusaka, in the recent past year, where you're a resident yourself, has had water problems in, 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 in some parts. So are these interventions enough? Well, they are mitigating mm -hmm. interventions, mm -hmm. and we are placing them in hotspot areas, the affected areas. Remember, it is not the whole Saka mm -hmm. that is affected. There are hotspots that are affected, and that is where the concentration is, and that is where the tanks have gone. And that is where we're making sure that the people are able to draw that clean water. So, yes, as we bury those uh, um, uh, shallow wells, we are making sure that we have given the people the alternative, which is safe clean water, which they can draw from the tanks. They are drawing it from the tanks for their cooking, for their washing, for their bathing, and for their drinking. So they're able to draw that clean water from the tanks which are dotted across their communities, various communities within the hotspot area. Mm. We've heard from you as uh, government, the Minister of, of, of Health, um, uh, the Minister of Water himself saying we need to depoliticize, you know, the pandemic. But other schools of thought are that this is the worst cholera epidemic in the recent past that we've had uh, in Lusaka, in Zambia. I mean, you're talking today over 5,000 uh, cumulative cases since the pandemic began in January. Uh, I mean, close to under just 300 people have died. Um, is it right to be pointing a finger at the UPND administration? Was it the lack of preparedness at, at, at local authority level? Uh, others would say, I mean, uh, I think one year when former Mayor Miles Sampa was at the helm of the city, we recorded no color cases. Why has it reached this stage? Or, or others are saying you are even restricting ordinary citizens from helping you to clean. Uh, should we, where's the politics in all this? And should the finger be pointed at anybody? There's no politics in it. It's just the people trying to bring politics. Already if you say, no, when Masampa was mayor, there was no cholera. So there's a PF mayor here now. So should we say it's a PF which has brought cholera in Lusaka? Mm. So we don't need to politicize. What we just need is to pull together. We can't have the same scale of cholera today as we had in the past. The population has grown. And if you go to the stadium, you go and see the number of patients there. Mainly, are young children seven years coming down. 
So these are Pekinese in the communities, and these are the vulnerable ones that are easily picking up the disease, and also the, the, the male folk. You have very few females, but you have a lot of male folk, youth, that are picking up this, and they're picking it up from, firstly, excessive uh, drinking of this uh, illicit alcohol, which is made out of the very water that they draw from the shallow wells. And that's what they make alcohol with, and they drink that, and they're picking it up. But also, they're the ones now in the markets and so on. So they're the ones that are vulnerable. So the vulnerable groups, when you go to the stadium, you find that it is the male youth and the children. And this is exacerbated by the fact that the populations have grown. So we can't talk about the numbers that were there before and the numbers that we have now. It goes without saying, we have more people now. And therefore, if we're going to have a calamity, the impact will still be more. So we don't want to get ourselves into this politics of blaming this one, pointing a finger at this one. What we just want is to ensure that we save the lives of the people. And that is the call of His Excellency the President. He has said to all of us his charges on the ground, save lives. I don't want people to die. Whatever you do, priority number one, save lives. And that is why you are seeing that if you go to the stadium, all logistics are in place. Mm. The procurement people are working 24-7. But, but, but could the it be numbers? There. Yes, yes, yes. Granted, the population for Lusaka has grown. When you look at the last census, we're talking um, uh, over three uh, point something million people. So we agree with you. But in terms of preparedness, permanent secretary, have we done enough through DMMU and other line ministries, local government, uh, the civic authority, especially that before this last year we had floods in Kamala South and so on, that problem was never really averted. We saw uh, an operation by the local government ministry to get to rid the streets of vendors. They still came back. Our, our capital city is filthy. It's an eyesore. Have we done enough for preparedness? And th there's still mm. lots of garbage in our city. We continue to work hard. Mm. Tomorrow you will see a renewed uh, focus mm. to get rid of street vendors. I think uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, a few more men uh, in boots on the ground to ensure that uh, um, street vending is kept. Because that is also a great source of concern. And that's where the field is being uh, generated. In terms of preparedness, what we had last year were floods, which, for example, in Kamala South, a, an entire clinic was abandoned because it was flooded and people could not access it. Members of staff had to relocate and go and be stationed at the shops on higher land because there was flooding at the clinic. If you go there today, and that's where we were yesterday, and that's what we were speaking from among the places we did so yesterday, it's dry because we engage ZNS. The MMU engaged ZNS to do drainages in various points of Osaka. And that is why you have seen that those areas which ordinarily last year were very flooded are dry now because ZNS has done the drainages. So even in Kamala, if you go there, you find the clinic is accessible, the land is dry because there's a drainage which has been done by ZNS. As we you know, conclude on the cholera, you know, aspect as permanent secretary in charge of communication and information. What is the messaging, you know, to the people out there, especially that some feel there's not much that they're getting from government? Well, the much they can get from government is an appeal for us for cleanliness. Embarrassingly, this disease is about filth. Matenda Adodia, Songa Tisunga, who have difficulties. So we need to ensure that we remain clean. This disease is defeated, number one, by tidiness, by cleanliness. So let us be clean. Then we take it up from there. Let's get to aspects surrounding, you know, the Ministry of Information. And obviously, in my introduction, I spoke about the uh, signing into law by the President late last year, the Access to Information Bill, which is now uh, an act. Uh, obviously, there have been many 
uh, reactions following that in terms of the full proof of, of this, concerns around uh, certain lacuna uh, in the piece of legislation. The key aspect is, will this bill be put to a test and will the UPND administration be equal to the task to give citizens the freedoms to have access to information, both public and private? Yes. We are more than ready. Remember that this bill, before it became law, was actually brought as a private member's bill on the floor of the House in 2002 by then Livingston Member of Parliament, Honorable Sakuba Scott, UPND. So this is a UPND uh, baby, so to say. Also, in the UPND manifesto, it is clearly stated that we were to implement the um, access to information uh, law. And now that it has gone through Parliament uh, and the President has assented to it, it has become law. So, what I'm noticing is that a lot of people have not taken time to read the law. They are shooting from the hips. Number one, this law to reach to where it is today, it has gone through various consultative processes and stakeholder after stakeholder have participated to fine tune it. It was uh, taken before the people, stakeholders uh, uh, had an input, it went to justice, justice did the layman's bill, uh, it was taken back to the stakeholders, the stakeholders panel beat it, and it was taken before parliament, the parliamentary select committee again called for stakeholders input, and it went through parliament without any, any amendments, clearly showing that the stakeholders are saying, yes, this is the law we agreed to give unto ourselves. Of but course, today you have oh, people. Oh, of course, you have people wanting to say oh, this law. There's this lacuna. There's no, that of, lacuna. Of, of, of course, Before yes. I even read anything oh, on it. Oh, well, it's, it's it's not true to say that not everybody has read the bill and the act. Uh, granted that we've had over two decades of this, you know, process. So better an act than nothing. Mm. Uh, I think that is the general consensus of many of the stakeholders. But but some of the questions for example, that were submitted even to, to the Committee on Parliament that was receiving some of these submissions. What do you take uh, of submissions, for example, that there needs to be a supremacy clause uh, in, the, in the aspect of conflict with other pieces of legislation? There are also other concerns, uh, um, and you can explain this further through the Ministry, that this ATI bill, uh, Act rather, will be sitting under the human rights you know, commission. So there, there, there are some of these concerns, uh, but not to say that in its entirety, the whole act is a bit, is a bad piece of legislation. I've seen those uh, uh, concerns, mm. and I think what is important to state is that, like I stated earlier, that we are, that bill had undergone various stakeholder consultations, various stakeholder inputs until it secured stakeholder buy-in. To begin to say, let's do this and that now, is basically to suggest that we amend. And yes, it can be amended, but yes. I, I, I was but, going to ask to say, is yet. the door shut to amendments? No, it is not. Mm. We can amend it in future as we are going. Mm. But for now, there is no room for amendment. And what, what we are doing as a ministry now is to go out and prepare the public workers and tell them there is this law. And this law now will require that people will come to you to look for information. And when they are looking for that information, you must make that information available. So those days of stealing are gone. You can no longer just come and say, we gave a social cash transfer 50 beneficiaries. We gave fees to 200 beneficiaries. No, the people will say, ah, oh, tell them as in. Mm. Who is this one? But, 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 is this one? Yeah. but, but as, as, as we look at the implementation and full operationalization of, mm. of the law, because once the president signs, it becomes law, mm. um, there was this pre-argument before this, this thing was law, whether it will only benefit journalists or it will benefit an entire citizenry to enhance democracy. From your perspective, you know, Permanent Secretary, systems, for example, can a citizen go into, say, the Ministry of Agriculture and say, can I know 
uh, how many beneficiaries have received fertilizer under FISP? Can I go into Ministry of Local Government and say, I want to know how many beneficiaries of CDF in my constituency? How will it work? Yes, precisely that. Mm. Precisely that. Mm. You can go to the Ministry of uh, Local Government and you want to have access to information in your constituency. Mm. Who has benefited under CDF? Who are these people? You have the right to go and find that information. And the officers, the public officers, have a mandate and a duty to make that information available to you. The same with agriculture, the same with them. I saw recently gentleman Sean Tembo going to Electoral Commission of Zambia and writing a letter that he wants to, uh, this is it, to give him uh, the declaration of the assets, declaration for, president of assets uh, by, for the president. And this is where I'm coming from when I say, it looks like you. Some people have not read it. Because if you read it, it's very clear, even in, I think, Article 20, if I'm not uh, mistaken, very clear as it relates to third party information. These people refer to as third parties. So, Sean Tembo to go to ECZ and ask ECZ to give him that information. The law now mandates ECZ to write to the concerned third party to seek for authority to release that information. And the third party will respond to the uh, electoral commission, I think it's in 21 days, if I'm not mistaken, to either allow them or not allow them. Otherwise, it becomes uh, is, chaotic is, because is, someone is, will is, just is, come. In, in the same vein, is this for public institutions, public bodies, or, or, or because I think the ATI talks no, about for, for public for, 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 for public for, bodies for public for, for a corporate public body, and there's there's stipulation for private individuals. For, yes, for public bodies it is different. Mm. That is open information. It is in public interest. Mm. But for individuals, it's third mm. party, it, and it, it is personal information. I, I, so, for I, example, I, I know that I know for, that for even before you became PS, you've been at this issue of uh, declaration of assets for a very long time. For example, and it has made you popular and unpopular uh, on, 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 on either legal fronts. Isn't the presidential declaration of assets a matter of public interest, P.S.? Look. Is it a private matter or law, a matter of public the, interest? The law in this country had provided mm. that when you declare your assets, ECZ will publish. Mm. So, when one candidate has over two million, then after eight months or so, we're going to another election. Can I pay the 26 million? Yeah. And the people say, ah, who of me are going Amazon says? Now to say, ah, oh, and who from Sangaku, what more this other one? We are going for four five years. Who oh, have 400 billion at your conch. They change the law. They stop the law. And they stop ECZ from publishing. So why do you want Araende to publish what is against the law? No, no. They changed the law. No, no. But, 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 but I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure that uh, the law was changed in that particular aspect. And I think there's court determination to that. But in the, in the aspect of public interest, and now with the play of the access to information bill, I'm asking, isn't the aspect of public declaration of assets, not only, not only other, actually, for the president, mm. because even members of parliament are mandated. Mm. Um, I know that through the ministerial code of conduct or even the public service conduct, uh, there are certain things that you must declare even as a civil servant, mm. whether you receive certain things. So is this not an aspect of public interest? It is an aspect of public interest. Based on the example that you've but actually given. It is an aspect of public interest. But we must also understand mm. that if the law provides that this information is not to be given to the public anymore, that is the law. You can't have institutions that go against the law. So you are, you can't have are you telling me? Are you, are, 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 you te are you telling me this evening? And if you're telling me that, what law are you quoting that restricts the public from accessing the assets of a presidential candidate? For example, the ATI deals with that aspect as third-party information. Mm. So then, this is a has to write to the president. That's him if they should release that information to the person that is looking out, looking out for it. Is that, so not the, in, the is, is, is that not in conflict then with the requirements of one filing in to be present? Because the requirements the, are that you must declare your assets to ECZ, mm. assets and liabilities to ECZ. And you meet that requirement, you declare. Previously, ECZ would now publish the same to the public. But they changed so, the law so, so, and stopped ECZ so, so, from so, publishing. So, what would that be the rationale for us to know what? 
the assets so of, of, that's just hold on no no so uh, uh, you're also trying to play politics now by blaming those who came before you uh, I'm not saying so, 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 so in short in, in short you're saying that them changing that was a bad move well, of course I want to clap for them it was a bad move I want so to clap why, for why don't you do the right thing then well, well, by lifting the fact that, <laughs> because the whole aspect the, uh, of of this ATI is to put to to lift a veil off issues of corruption, for example, like you've said, if I came into office with four million, suspiciously in four months I've got ten million. Suddenly, if a whistleblower comes through, and then you say the law doesn't allow for a third party to release this information, how are we going to fight corruption? Yeah, look, we are a law-abiding government. So currently, that's what the law states. So every law is, um, uh, is, uh, is available to be amended. So when the law is amended, we will also again be able to abide by the law. Mm -hmm. Currently, we are abiding by the law, because mm -hmm. that's what the law states. I earlier on did ask you how, for the sake of the viewers this evening, how will this work in terms of its operationalization uh, in that we're told really the, the, the effectiveness of this sits under the Human Rights Commission? Well, firstly, for it to take full, that way, Dimashupa, operationalization. Yeah. Operationalization. <laughs> <laughs> so let's just say, to make it operation, so that it's, it's easier for all of us to speak. So for this law to become operational, the minister has to sign, um, um, like an SI has to sign an SI to bring it into effect. And once he signs the SI, it comes into effect. Once the law has come into effect, all institutions now have a grace period of two years to conform with the law, to ensure that they put in place all that is required to conform with the law. If they need to have certain officers placed in certain places, front desk or so on, they need to have photocopiers there and so on, they need to have uh, pre-prepared packs of information and so on, they have two years to do that. And also you have the Human Rights Commission, which is an oversight of this particular law, such that if you are denied that information, it's like your human right has been infringed upon and you can take it up. That's, that, that, that is what I was going to ask. So if, if, if I'm attempting to get information and mm. I'm denied that, what is the procedure to to, 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 uh, to complain or, or appeal? Would it be through a tribunal? Do I go straight to court? Mm -hmm. So, the, I don't want to mislead the people here. So, the detail will, will, will be ironed out as because mm. I'm aware that tomorrow we are having a stakeholders meeting with HRC and other players to also begin to detail how we shall put into operation the same law. So I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, mm. and I don't want to mislead the people, I just want to mislead myself. So I think after the engagement and the conclusion and the agreement by all stakeholders, then we'll be able now to bring up the information. Mm. Obviously to every law there are exceptions, and uh, over the years through the Constitution there are specific aspects to do with uh, security. Um, we saw recently, even in the famous or infamous gold scandal, the aspect of the investigative wings asking that the matter be held, you know, in, in camera. And actually, uh, to the isolation of, of even coverage due to the sensitivity of the matter, how do we look at the process of declassification of information in terms of where can I go, where can I not go? Security matters, for example. Yeah, it's all part of putting it into operation, it will be able to state mm. what is classified information, what is unclassified information, what is deemed to be information of um, bordering on national security, mm. and so on. Remember that among the stakeholders that had a buy-in into the current law is actually the uh, security wings that said, yes, to this extent we can release information, but from here on, this is now national. So when we finish with these meetings that we are doing now, as we come up with the way to put the law into operation, all these will be stipulated. Mm. 
some of the issues that were raised during the submissions before the Committee of Parliament, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you also made some 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 submissions as 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 a ministry uh, on this um, were aspects surrounding uh, foreigners mm. and um, the, the, whether foreigners are also legible uh, to access some of this information and again the security dangers that are posed uh, and and also making a comparison on how this ATI bill in comparison with international law works uh, what is the policy outline within the act in terms of foreigners and, and really who, whether they can access information freely? To the extent to which they are looking for that information and what they want to utilize mm -hmm. it for. Mm -hmm. There are issues to do with spying and espionage mm -hmm. and, and the national security and all those are taken into um, consideration. Remember when you are seeking this information, you put it in writing, you state exactly what it is you are looking for and what sort of information you are looking for. So depending on what you have asked for, uh, it will be looked at and uh, it will be determined by the experts if that information really ought to be given to you or not, or if it's information that is bordering on a spy collecting information or espionage, you know, plotting against the country and so on. So the experts are there to be able to deduce from your submission what it is that you want to utilize that information possibly for and they determine your way forward. For this to really effectively work, one would obviously believe that more work needs to be done on the public sector side, and on this I mean government, the civil service, because the bulk of systems and information lie with government, whether you look at the executive, the legislature, you look at uh, the judiciary in itself. Um, I know there's smart Zambia in place. P.S. how much have we done to digitize, to go uh, communication smart in government operations? Because I'm not thinking that every citizen should be walking into an office and be asking for a folder of information. Somebody has to log in just somewhere and obviously have access to some of this information from a push point of view from the system. Of course, there's information packs that are made available. And when those information packs are put together, there are also soft copies, digital copies, that people can access online uh, using our Smart Zambia and using the government bus. They are able to go and find that information uh, online. So that is already being taken uh, into account. There is no need to uh, worry or panic that it will always be just hard copy papers and people physically working in. There is information packs. Remember that public workers are being told to be proactive. Do not wait for the people to come and look for the information. Make it available. Make it ready. So that at the click of the button, someone can... But have, 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 have we done enough? There's some ministries that no, we, hardly, we, hardly even have a website. Yes, we... And we, some of, uh, 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 of the information up there is, is quite outdated. Yes, we, we, are, we are on it, and mm. this is where we have begun our sensitizations. We just began the southern province. We will go around the country sensitizing public workers, making them aware that basically there is this law it has come, and this is how we are supposed to deal with this law. This is how we're supposed to work within the framework of the law, and this is how we are to deal with members of the public under this law. And that is why we are sensitizing members of the public and making them members of the public sector, making them understand that as public servants, actually the information belongs to the people. We are custodians on behalf of the people, and therefore when they demand for it, we must be able to give them. The days of hiding under the veil of confidentiality are now gone. So there's nothing like you come and say, you were giving uh, social cash transfer beneficiaries in that area. How many did you give? Oh, I gave 300. Who are these? Excuse me. That is not your information. I gave 300. Those days are gone. You need now to show who are these 300. Mm -hmm. Because for every ghost uh, recipient or beneficiary, you are displacing an actual. So this is going to work out well now. Even FISIP, for example, you find that government has released enough packs, but you find on the ground people are sharing fertilizer because there's also an element of ghost recipients. Mm. Now, with this law in place, people should be able to say, there you gave 400 packs. Who are the people you gave 400 packs for? Then you must be able to... Have you, done, have, have you done enough? education and sensitization with, 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 with officers within the government system because 
Uh, if not, you start saying, Pierce, that this is political. For example, for some time now, there's been calls, uh, even from us, the media, when government signs certain uh, you know, public interest agreements, whether it's in the mines or it's, it's, it's with foreign countries, these ought now to just be, be because the, these are documents on behalf of the people of Zambia. So if tomorrow I go into Ministry of Mines and want to see the document between government and Vedanta and KCM, or I want to see what the Zambian government has signed uh, with the U.S. government, am I able to get that as a journalist? Let's test the law once it's put in operation. Let's test it. You will not say, now this is political. Let's test the law. So, and you're ready to have it tested? Yes. Last week, Permanent Secretary, uh, you made some statements that I want clarity over, and some sections uh, of society have not been so happy with you, one of them being the FBI condemning your statements. While uh, in opposition and still, uh, I think, at a few number of, of engagements in, in power, the UPND have committed that while they're in power, they will not and will never shut down any media house. Last week you said you're changing it from the word never to may or something like that. Could you clarify the statement you made regards this commitment? First of all, you are wrong. And you say I've changed it from the word never. That's why I'm asking for I, a clarification. Yes. That's why I'm asking you a clarification. I emphasized that the first time I spoke about this at an IBA event, I did state that this administration will not close down any media house. And then I emphasized that, be mindful, that I did not use the word never. And the reason I did not use the word never is simply this. You have a license to which you have got conditions, rules, regulations, laws to adhere to. If you go against them, the law then provides for the punitive measures to be taken against you. So if the law provides that you should be shut down, you will be shut down and nobody will apologize. What is your difference between, so, so if, if you say the law, uh, if it provides you'll be shut down without that, with, with, without um, any, any qualms, uh, shutting it down even if the law is being abused? When you have infringed the law, the law provides even if the law is being abused, because we've seen that in the past, how, how can we've the, seen that in the past itself, the law has been manipulated. I think, I think let us, the law let has us put been it, manipulated. Let us put it into proper context. Mm. I was speaking around the element of tribal hate speech mm. that radio stations, especially, have got this tendency of bringing unscrupulous characters on their airwaves, and these people are busy spewing tribal hatred, literally putting out hate speech to the nation, but you cannot, dividing but, but, the but, but, but you yourself, you know, peers cannot be judge and jury. There is a procedure to this. The, the, the IBN itself must operate as an independent and autonomous body, as a regulator, and if such a station does that, there is a procedure. The rules, the, the rules of natural justice call for that. Yes. You cannot be sheriff, peers, and just say, I will shut you down. No, but again, you are wrong. I did not say I will shut you down. No, you I have are, said. You are saying here that you're, you are referring to aspects of hate speech. And law will be followed. So if the law says that you can yeah, but, 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 you can but, 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 but this is what I'm saying. It is wrong for you before the due process of the rules of natural oh, but course, justice what are, you are, are taken you for you as peers to say that because it's your opinion. They obviously have the right to justify or defend themselves. You see, I don't even know why it's like you, this same FBI of yours. Look, no, 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 no. What I'm yes. telling you, what I'm telling you here is that when you infringe the law, the law will be followed. No, 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 no. So what is wrong with that? Peers, before somebody is charged and convicted of an offense, you cannot outrightly just say they are wrong. Somebody has a presumption of innocence. Yeah, but why are you skipping the process? What I'm it's telling you... It's you who's skipping no, the process. What I'm telling you is that when you infringe the law, the process, the due process will be followed. That's what I'm saying. The due process will be followed. And I have said that whatever it is that the punitive measure 
prescribes in the law is what will be done. Yeah, but but what, you, but what that, you were issuing be... what you were issuing was a warning. Was it? It was a warning. Well, take it that way. I also give it to you as a, a kind reminder <laughs> that be careful. Don't 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 put the nation in fire mm. with your airwaves. Mm. I gave examples. I said countries that have found themselves in problems, mm. civil wars, some even as bad as genocide. Mm. Those things were exacerbated by people going on radio and on television and spewing and that's why we and that's and that's why and we as a country and that's why we must we, avoid and, and that's that. why we have a regulator yes and that's why we have a regulator thank you so 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 why then uh would you also not be protecting and i find it sometimes odd peers yeah. that uh when you I don't, want you to, I don't want you to call you a politician today because you're a civil servant. Yeah. But when you're in the opposition and you switch camp, yeah. exact things that were done to you are the things that you begin to support and begin to change your narrative. Yeah. I've been with you, uh, whether we want to call it trenches or yeah. whatever, yeah. The, the, the time of VPN, I was with you here, yeah. the time of VPN and so yeah. on, uh, and, 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 and how it was difficult for you Mr. Kawana, in the opposition then, yeah. to just get airtime, even on, 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 on public stations, mm -hmm. private stations, and so You remember this? Yes. Why would you support this time around that a PS like you or yourself can go to a radio station or call a radio station and start threatening innocent citizens and start threatening radio stations? I think you are being notorious no, I'm not. by wanting to claim that you are being threatened. You can only, no. be, you can only be threatened. Uh, threatened? Ah, they can see this. They can well, what, what do you mean well, well, we're no, big no, notorious? When you are talking, I can't What do you mean we're so big notorious? Well, those are the facts. So, mm. Let me explain. Mm. You are being notorious. No, I'm not. I'm okay? asking you a question. Why you are being notorious? And you're intimidating you? me, actually, what? by using uh, such no. words. You've why, come why for me to ask you questions. Okay, why are you running? Let your language be civil. I'm not being notorious. I'm asking you a question. I'm asking you a question. <laughs> you are being uh, such pay that is wrong. Uh, so, why are you rushing mm. to say that we are being threatened? You can only be threatened if what I'm speaking to mm. is what you're doing. Mm. So if you know that you have lined up guests to come and spew tribal hatred, to come and spew hate speech, mm. to come and mm. play a role to try and divide this nation. Mm. You know very well that that's what you have so, so, lined so, up. So, so, and then so, I so, say, so, if you do that, we will uh, come for you. So, then you feel threatened. So, so, so I've moved away. Otherwise, you I, won't I've, feel threatened. I, I've moved away from the hate speech uh, issue because you and I established that the due process will be followed. Yes. So we've settled that. Uh, um, let me be very specific. I'm talking about the Cabo incident mm -hmm. where a caller on a station, which you also do, Mm. Uh, P.S. Kawana, uh, when you feel that government is being attacked, you've made it ex e e explicitly clear mm. in your right of freedom of expression, you will either drive to the station or to that station or call in. Mm. So is it right for, a, uh, not yourself, mm. but even another P.S., to call and start intimidating another citizen with freedom of expression who says the cost of living is high? Of course that is not correct. It is not good to intimidate our citizens but also it depends on the environment and what was going on. I've heard assertions in that direction. I am yet to listen to that audio, because I'm told there's an audio. Mm. I am yet to listen to the audio so that I'm able to deduce what exactly transpired, who said what, and how it was said, and in which context. Mm. But off the surface, uh, it is safe to state that as government officials, it is not correct for us to intimidate our citizens, especially when they're only asking us to account. Does this, does this UPND administration take very kindly to criticism? It seems you're not so thick-skinned to, 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 to criticism, even when it's just right. To, I am to, surprised. To, to question you. you. I'm surprised. You, you don't you, take kindly. I'm surprised that you can accuse us of... I'm not accusing, speaking. I'm asking you. Oh, That's okay. a challenge. I'm asking you a question. Yes. Okay, let me answer you. <laughs> Surely, you have a, a regime with a leader who says, this law that keeps looking at people claiming they've insulted me, mm. get rid of it. Mm. That shows you that we have got the thickest skin. There is no president in the history of this country that has been insulted as much as this leader is insulted every day, abused every day. But he says, eyes on the ball. 
I'm here to save the people. As long as that child in Mugubu, that child of Muzipa Galuao, that child from Muzipa Kawalala has gone to school for free, I have done my part. So let them insult, but don't arrest them. If there's a law that makes you arrest them because they've insulted me, remove the law. I mean, really, what better illustration do you need for people with a big skin? We are not immune to criticism. We take criticism, but not very kindly or lightly. No, we do it. We do it very kindly and politely. That is why. Quindle, yeah. don't so. Sorry, sorry. So that is why. Uh, when, for example, you, are, you have a guest here, and Kalapa and Ogunama mm. Boza, I'll call you as a cost. That person you have there is telling lies. Do you want to give us an opportunity to come so that we also give us an story? It's a come, and we come. But if, if it's another person, you, you, you can't allow them to do that? No, I've always said I'm free. So like now, so. Mm. Now we. Oh, we have nothing to hide. We are, we, are, we are an open government. And that is why sometimes I saw your colleague, your workmate, uh, John. John, from the state house, press briefing, everything. Yeah, it was stormed, it was stormed. It so the other night I was watching you and your colleagues on your course down your end of year. And, and Andrew was now explaining that I know actually this is what transpired. He called. And we allowed him, and Nakachinda also allowed him. I was saying, ah, I was sitting with my wife there. And I said, now let me hear John. I said, ah, oh, so that's what transpired. Then my apologies for having painted Mr. Gawana black. But you see, we get painted black. We are public officials. Somebody will just insist that, no, he went and stopped the station. Manalis. But I was invited. I was allowed. Even the other guests allowed me to come. So, equally, you should be able to allow other citizens to express yes, themselves yes, freely the way we allow yes, you. Yes, it's, it's when I go When I go on media platforms, mm -hmm. we open the lines, we allow the So you to must talk. be condemning acts where citizens are intimidated to say you should not be talking I about have the stated, I have stated here mm -hmm. that us as leaders, mm -hmm. we are not supposed to intimidate our people when they want to hold us to account. We don't do that. It is not correct to do that. So, yes, and I have also stated that I've heard of the Kabwe incident, but I've not listened to the audio. Mm. Until then, I would not be able to speak to it uh, adequately because I've not heard that audio. P.S. Cowan, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming to our first cost of 2024. And uh, we'll see how we put the ATI Act to test and uh, be able to follow up with you. Yes, uh, let me just end by re-emphasizing that third-party information is private. So it's, it's not like because now there's ATI, but you go to UTH, now on a costa to Kapan, it's not what I can, it's not what I can, it's not what I can, no, 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 they can't do that. UTH will not give that person that information, they have to call you. Well, obviously, as the law is put into operation, well, the test of the pudding is in the AT. Oh, yes. My guest this evening has been the Permanent Secretary for the Ministry of Information and Media, P.S. Tabo Kawana. This has been the first cost for 2024. Welcome to a brand new year. Good night and God bless.